Hi, I'm Natalie Jenner. I am the author of the upcoming novel, The Jane Austen Society. This is a story about eight very different people who come together at the end of World War II, bond over their shared love of Jane Austen, and decide to form a society to try and save the cottage in Chawton, where Jane Austen had lived and worked on most of her major works. This is a very fictional and imagined account of what actually did happen in the 1940s. And it was the preservation of both the Chawton Cottage that Jane Austen had lived in, but also Chawton House itself that has really inspired me over the years as a tourist, as a fan of Jane Austen, and now as a debut author at age 52. So I'm thrilled to be taking part in the Lockdown Literary Festival. I have absolutely no academic or research qualifications entitling me to be here. I am a tourist and a fan, just like you. I am, however, someone who was lucky enough to, get to spend a whole week in Chawton House and in Alton, um, I guess now almost three years ago this September. So what I'd like to do today is just tell you a little bit about the trip I took how Chawton House inspired me, and how my book really reflects that passion that people have for Austin, and that has made Chawton a mecca for fans from around the world, and also this beautiful Elizabethan house that so many of us care about and want to see continue to thrive and flourish. So I am somebody who tried very hard to get published earlier in her life, and I have five unpublished novels that are firmly locked away in a drawer. Um, I even opened a small independent bookshop a handful of years ago as a way to keep books a part of my life. I love reading and writing and have done since I was two or three years old. So I opened this bookshop about four and a half years ago, and four months into running it, we get a very devastating diagnosis from my husband of what would turn out to be a genetic form of lung disease that was affecting many people in his family. And it was an incredibly difficult year because it was a murky diagnosis. There was some uncertainty with the timeline. We were told most people pass away within two to three years of diagnosis. We were young enough that we did not know what we should be doing with our time. And I really kind of pulled back a bit. I would had a very busy year with the bookshop and I needed a quiet year. And when I need quiet, I need Jane Austen. So I started to reread a lot of Jane Austen and a lot of books about Jane Austen. I also binge watched quite a bit of television. I remember blowing through all 20-ish years of Cheers and then Frasier. I also watched Downton Abbey on a loop and a lot of a I think it's a BBC show here called Escape to the Country, which the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation was showing all the seasons, one episode a day. So I had a lot on my mind about old buildings and houses and um, dream places to live. And as a family, we took a few bucket list trips. My husband went and golfed um, with some guy friends, and I put up my hand in the summer of 2017, and I said, I want to go spend some time alone in Chawton, and I love all of you, but I want to have time alone at both the Jane Austen's House Museum and Chawton House. In fact, I love Chawton House, I think, so much in part because on five or six different trips to the United Kingdom over the past 10 years, we kept showing up in Chawton on a Monday when the house um, historically had not been open to the public. So I became very intrigued with getting inside Chawton House. In fact, on one trip, Jeremy Knight, um, the direct descendant of, of the Knight family, was uh, helping out as a tour guide at the museum. And he told us, um, when we couldn't get in that day, he told us that we could look over the style at the back of the churchyard at St. Nicholas and we could get a, a good side view of the house. Um, so that was really thrilling and that view actually made it into my book. So in the summer 2017, I'm gonna make this trip on my own and it is the 200th anniversary of the celebrations of Jane Austen's death. And I show up in Alton 
and I check in at the Swan Inn, which was the original coaching inn that Jane Austen had taken. I stayed at herself. And every morning I walk from Alton to Chawden, just like Jane and Cassandra would have done. And I am the first person to arrive at the Jane Austen's House Museum in the morning, and I am the last person to leave Chawden House at the end of the day. Getting inside Chawden House was a real thrill for me um, as a tourist, um, but I was, I think, most impressed by the level of detail and the aesthetic beauty of this Elizabethan home. And I had been reading a few books, including Among the Jainites by Deborah Yaffe. I don't know if any of you have read this book. But there is a chapter dedicated to Sandy Lerner, and it is the story of how she acquired Chawden House at auction in the early 90s and spent so much time and money restoring it. So I get inside Chawden House, and I can just see the level of work that's being done. It's so impressive. I spend, honestly, untold amounts of time hiding out in reading nooks. And I was once reading Jane Austen in the large, deep window seat in the dining room for, I think, a good 20 minutes without getting caught. Um, I also love the reading nook in the um, ladies withdrawing room on the upper floor that is part of the Elizabethan porch um, and looks out directly above the front entrance. I took tea every afternoon in the courtyard, and that was one of my absolute favorite things to do. And I loved walking the grounds. I would put my 1995 Pride and Prejudice soundtrack in my ears with my earbuds, and I would uh, walk the, the garden and the walled garden and the lime grove and saw the shepherd's hut. And I loved the peace and beauty of the St. Nicholas churchyard. It was a really wonderful trip. Even though I was very scared and worried about my husband's future, I was very energized and inspired by this trip. I came home and I continued to do a lot of reading. One of the books that I bought in the bookstore at Chawden House, Jane and Me, My Austin Heritage by Carolyn Jane Knight. So she's Jane Austen's fifth great niece. And she writes a very touching, familial, private view of what it was like growing up in this house over the years. And it really sort of affected me. It made me realize that a family had lived there, that it wasn't just about Jane Austen. And finally, I read um, another great book called Reading Austen in America by Professor Juliet Wells. And this book is a very interesting analysis of these different texts, uh, versions of Emma from America, and that uh, Ms. Wells, Professor Wells, had been able to actually track down an additional two. And in analyzing these six older editions, she um, really shone a light on the nature of fandom of Jane Austen. And it really kind of hit home for me that a lot of the fans had been men. So Almost a year goes by and my husband's health starts to stabilize on some experimental treatments. And I start to get, I remember in the spring of 2018, that first sense of genuine hope for the future, not the dread anymore, the permanent black dog dread that sits on your shoulder when you're given a limited um, time with a diagnosis. And I feel like writing again. And my daughter very distinctly remembers that one day I looked up from my reading and I said, I'm going to write a book about a group of people trying to save an old British house, like Downton Abbey. And a few weeks later, we came back from our first Jane Austen conference that we went to. It was in Philadelphia with the East Pennsylvania chapter of the Jane Austen Society of North America. And there were four very amazing speakers there that day. And one of the recurring themes that was coming up was the theme of grief in Jane Austen, particularly in persuasion. And that really stayed with me as well. It made me realize and appreciate how much Jane Austen had written and worked through times of grief and, and chronic pain and illness and worry herself. And then my daughter remembers a few weeks later, I looked up again and I said, I'm going to write a book about a group of people that come together to save Jane Austen's house. Now, I don't outline at all. So what I did was I 
came up with about eight to 10 characters, some of which survived the cut, some of which didn't. Half men and half women, because I did want to reflect that strong historical presence of male fans um, around Jane Austen and her works. And I sit down to type. I know right away I'm calling it the Jane Austen Society. And I start to type the first chapter and the first image that comes to me is of a man, very sad and lonely, I don't know why yet. And he's lying on the old stone wall of St. Nicholas Church. And I remember doing that myself the previous fall. And I'd had my little copy of Emma and I had it on my chest and I was so anxious for my husband, but also so inspired by the beauty of Chawton House around me. So this is the first image that comes to mind and this remains the first chapter of my book. In the first chapter, an American tourist, like me, shows up trying to find the house. It's 1932. She meets the farmer. And they start talking, and he starts explaining to her Chawton House and the graves of Cassandra and their mother in the St. Nicholas churchyard. And the American tourist is becoming very overcome, which is a feeling that I could relate to, and I'm sure all of you have as well. When you see the little desk where Jane Austen sat and wrote the little table, and when you see the graves, and you see um, the view in the Jane Austen House Museum of the street, the view that she had, her authorial eye. And these are very moving moments as tourists. So I'm writing this chapter. I have this tourist going through the same emotions that I've explored and, and experienced myself. And she convinces the farmer that he should give reading Jane Austen a shot. So he takes Pride and Prejudice out of the library and it goes fast. He's he's having a blast. And I realize as I'm writing this that I will get to stay close to Jane Austen if I write this book. And I will get to stay close to Chawton House. And in fact, Chawton House directly inspired several of my characters. There were, were two villagers sitting in the courtyard of Chawton House having tea. And they're debating Emma. And I think this is in chapter four of my book. And as I'm watching the characters, I actually could remember how you could look down on the courtyard through the stained glass windows on the second floor. And suddenly I realized someone is sitting there watching my characters. And that's where another character, Francis Knight, comes into existence. And now a fictional version of the Knight family has entered the scene. I have completely made up the Knight family from 1860 onwards. And I wanted, um, you know, to make sure that there was no um, risk of any characters getting mistaken, either in terms of the society that was actually formed or the Knight family. So I checked census records. I made sure there was no similarity in names to the extent I could. And Francis Knight is the remaining, sole remaining heir in my story to the Chawton estate. And she is traumatized and troubled herself she is having a hard time leaving this beautiful house. Um, she is becoming agoraphobic over time. And I also created another character because of Chawton House. I love the rooms and I would visually remember the rooms and the layout and describe characters walking in and out. And I had this one servant girl that kept passing Francis on her way to dust the library. And one day I just went, what the heck is that? servant doing in the library. And that led to a whole significant part of the book, which will involve the fact that Evie, this young house girl who's 16 and had to leave school when she was 14 to help support her family, is secretly cataloging the Knight Family Library in Chawton House. Little did I know that at the time that I'm writing this book, there is actually the start of the Gomershin Lost Sheep Society which is uh, a group that started up and is trying to locate the many Knight Family Library volumes from both Chawton House and Godmersham Park and others that have been scattered over the centuries. So it was a little bit of art imitating life when I was writing that. And I really loved every second of writing my book. 
when it was done, my husband read it and said, I think you have something here. I sent it off to New York and I landed an agent right away. And then the book sold in a bidding war in New York about a year and a half ago. And I was so thrilled when it sold uh, English language rights um, to the UK and Commonwealth to Orion Books. As someone who was born in England and lived my first few years here, I am a lifelong Anglophile and I was thrilled to know that my book would be coming out here. So I came about a year ago to meet with my editor at Orion Books and through common acquaintance was able to connect with the new CEO of Child and House, Katie Child. And Katie very kindly offered to give me a private tour of Chawton House. And when I came, we were on the lower level floor. And I realized that in my mind, because I'd wanted the library in my book to be a high traffic area, I had placed it right next to the great room downstairs. But if you've been there, you'll know that on the main floor, after the great room, there's a hallway. And then to the left, the dining parlor but there ain't no other library. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, there isn't another room down here. Um, what can be my library? And Katie um, very jovially showed me that there was actually a room under the stairwell that they think might've been a smoking room and a gentleman's room. And there was um, some very neat things in there. And I was like, yeah, this will work. This can be my library downstairs. Um, another change that I made was Katie took me to the upstairs attic, which I'd never been to before as well as a tourist. And I saw that there was a really lovely Southeast corner room that duplicates the same layout on the main and first floor. And I realized that that would make an excellent bedroom for my character, Francis. And I also realized that there was plenty of room up there to have a bedroom for a servant girl. So Evie got a room upstairs as well, which enabled her to have more presence in the book and get up to uh, no end of, of uh, goings on um, in the night by staying there. So these are just some examples of how my visit to Chawton House and my subsequent visit really directly affected the plot and the um, settings for my book. It was uh, an incredible experience to get a private tour. It is an incredible building. It really is a survivor. It was taken care of by the Knight family for centuries and then Sandy Lerner helped bring it forward into the 21st century and Chawton House, as it stands today, is for me a symbol of hope and a symbol of surviving and a really inspirational place. I will owe it a lifelong debt of gratitude for being there for me at a really difficult time in my personal life and energizing me and lighting an imaginative spark that has led to this incredible adventure. I am thrilled to share with you that the audiobook of my book, which is being released on the 28th of May as well in the UK, has been narrated by the wonderful British actor Richard Armitage, and that was a real thrill. He was actually a direct inspiration for several of the male characters, um, including Dr. Gray's, one of my favorite characters in the book. I also wanted to let you know that because I very much want Chawton House to um, survive and, and thrive, I am donating a, a small portion, 5% of my personal share of the UK royalties uh, directly to Chawton House. So I hope that you enjoyed this little clear inside scoop on my book and how it came about. I am thrilled to be here. I understand that there will be a live Q&A session on Twitter. Hit me up, ask me anything, I'm game. I, I hope if you read the book that you enjoy it. I hope that if you've been to Chawton that it rekindles in you memories of this wonderful place. I hope that it inspires you to, um, to think about books and art and culture and history. And I want to thank you for your time today and your attention. Please stay safe and please stay well. And I wish you all the best. Thank you.